your nation, your province, your Southern Alberta. From the heart of Lethbridge, it's Bridge City News Weekend Edition with Jeanette Roche. Hello, thanks for joining us. The RCMP have confirmed the bodies of two hikers have been found in the Coleman area of the Crow's Nest Pass. At approximately 10 p.m. on July 26, police were informed of two overdue hikers who had been exploring the North York Creek plane crash trail. On July 27th, search and rescue located bodies of the 34 and 35 year old men at the bottom of a ridge at Mount Coulthard. Both men were from Lethbridge. Is it okay for medical clinics in Canada to charge the patients that they treat? Well, that's a question being asked this week after Alberta Health Services was issued a directive by the Premier to investigate a Calgary clinic that plans to charge patients for faster access to a family doctor. Health Canada says the Marta Loop Medical Clinic would be breaching Medicare laws and that Alberta risks losing federal health transfer money if it doesn't do something about it. According to the clinic, beginning next week, it will see patients for free one day each each week. The other four days will be dedicated to patients who pay annual membership fees of $2,200 for individuals and $4,800 for a family. The Premier says AHS will investigate the clinic to ensure compliance with all legislation. A Calgary Member of Parliament says he's calling on the federal government to halt funding to the Stampede. Liberal MP George Chahal says the Stampede has lost people's trust after a partial settlement was reached this week in a class action lawsuit alleging that it, it allowed a staffer to sexually abuse young boys. Philip Harima was sentenced in 2018 to 10 years in prison for luring six boys into sexual relationships when he worked for the Stampede's Young Canadians School of Performing Arts. Chahal says government funding should only be restored when the victims feel that there has has been genuine accountability. The number of active forest fires burning in Western Canada is beginning to wane. In British Columbia, that number has now dipped below 400 as cooler weather and recent rain has cut the fire risk. Meanwhile, here in Alberta, emergency officials say there were 127 blazes burning in our, our province as of Friday morning. The Calgary Fire Department says two people have died in a house fire. Multiple calls came in about the fire just after midnight Wednesday morning. Uh, fire officials say a neighbor pulled one victim out of the burning home and the other was found in the basement. Two people were able to escape on their own. An Edmonton man was charged with terrorism following an investigation in the United Kingdom. Khaled Hussein, who is 28, was charged with membership of a proscribed organization after he was arrested at London's Heathrow Airport last week. He's charged alongside Ed Jem Chowdhury, a 56-year-old British preacher. British authorities say the charges relate to a proscribed organization known as the Islamic Thinkers Society. The Alberta government says more than a billion dollars will be invested into uh, increasing affordable housing units by 40 percent over the next decade. The province is now welcoming the second intake of applications for the Affordable Housing Partnership Program. This funding round of, of the Affordable Housing Partnership Program will make $68 million available to support new affordable housing projects across Alberta. Projects eligible for this funding include specialized housing, mixed income development to support households of different income levels, and mixed use developments offering a range of services in addition to housing. The federal conservatives gained a new member following a landslide by-election win Monday in former Prime Minister Stephen Harper's riding of Calgary Heritage. The seat's been vacant since conservative Bob Benzin, Benzin announced his res resignation and return to private life late last year. And it turns out the vote wasn't even close. But Monday, conservative candidate Shuv Majumder won with around 65% of the vote. Political reporter and Toronto Sun columnist Brian Lilly knows Majumder personally and introduces us to Calgary's newest MP. Uh, he's someone who's been active in both um building up democracy around the world and conservative circles for a long time. His, his time in the conservative movement goes back to Preston Manning and the Reform Party days. And, and just full disclosure, I've been a personal friend of uh, Shiv Majumder for a very long time. So I'm, I'm not sure I could say anything bad about him. He, he's a very smart guy, well-respected, um, a bit of a younger Michael Chong. Not that Michael Chong is, is 
uh, is old by any means, but uh, both of them very much focused on foreign policy areas, both of them very smart, both of them well-respected and liked. Coming up after the break, we have part of Naveen Day's conversation with Drew Barnes about the political paths in Alberta and what his thoughts are on the next steps for the province. Keep it right here. Welcome back. The Alberta provincial election that took place in May is very much in our rear view mirror now, and many of us are getting lost in the ebb and flow of political speeches and distractions. But it also seems as though political issues are more important now than ever. Our very own Naveen Day sat down with former Cypress Medicine Hat MLA Drew Barnes to talk about the political paths in Alberta and what his thoughts are on the next steps for the province. Take a look. The next steps for Albertans I believe needs to be more direct democracy. Um, the Swiss people go to the polls four times a year to vote on referendums, to vote on ideas, to vote on laws, whether it's putting them in or taking them out. Um, in my 11 years as MLA for Cypress Medicine Hat, and I was so grateful to be one of the 87 paid to speak on behalf of Albertans, it was always, I've consistently heard how. Albertans weren't happy with how fast the government was doing things or what they weren't doing or what they should be doing. We, we need more Albertans to step up and get involved. Um, so much of the system is, is big and, and immovable and it's hard. You know, effectiveness is not going to be easy, but, but that's what Albertans are telling me they'd still like to see. Now, one of the issues you've been passionate about is property rights for landowners. Can you talk about how property rights have changed or even possibly eroded over recent years here in our province? Oh, it's so disappointing. Uh, in 2012, one of the main reasons I got involved with the Wild Rose to be involved in provincial politics is because the Progressive Conservative Party at that time had a huge attack, a draconian attack on, on personal property rights. They actually put in Bill 36, 1924 and 50, where they, they could strip a title without access to courts and without access to compensation. Uh, and the, yeah, and those bills have been barely modified in 11 years, in spite of the fact we're now in our second success of Conservative government. Uh, my last private member's bill was to change that and, and restore property rights for individuals and families, um, but it died on the order paper under the last uh, Kenny and Smith government. So shows me the government really doesn't have any desire to make it happen. And why it's essential, Naveen, is, is how you create wealth and build prosperity is through following the rule of law and property rights. So now you're neither part of the UCP or the NDP, but based on what you've been seeing and hearing, what is your advice to the NDP and the UCP? Uh, well, let, let's start with, with Premier Smith and the UCP. Number one, we need a government that spends less so they can tax less. Uh, the, the, this carbon tax, I mean, it, it, it you know, it, the fact that we pay so much carbon tax through our tier one, one uh, carbon tax, like our fertilizer makers, our potato plants, they pay tons of carbon tax. And then the provincial government just recirculates it into renewables. My goodness, look at how expensive our utility bills have, have become. Let's, let's truly and legitimately end the carbon tax and let's make sure that the cost of utilities becomes affordable. Secondly, competition and business. The relationship is too cozy between big business and government. I tried to change some of the lobbying rules about a year ago, so making it so lobbying had to be more transparent, uh, a little more rules around who could lobby and who couldn't. Absolutely, we need to make it so there's less people up there asking for your hard earned tax dollar. Uh, thirdly, the fair deal. Um, you know, I, I'm getting a little tired when I see all the premiers get together and yell at the prime minister for more money. And as soon as he gives them a bit more, they, they all all be quiet. It is time to legitimately tell Ottawa we demand a fair deal. And Naveen, the best way I think to do that is we tell Ottawa three years from now, we're going to have an independence referendum. Ottawa, you've got three years to give us a fair deal and we'll let Albertans decide if the deal deal is fair or not. And also speak Speak the truth and, and, and 
speak it in a truthful way. As an example, this net zero discussion that the Premier and the Prime Minister are having right now is so wrong. Um, you know, the UCP government's making a they're making it look like they're 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 talking like they're against the the net zero, but in reality, when you dig into it, uh, Trudeau and the federal Liberals are saying net zero by 2035. The UCP is saying net zero by 2050. Either one will cost the either one will cost the people of Alberta 200,000 jobs, billions of billions of dollars of, of of value and prosperity and net worth. Let's call net zero what it is. It it, it is it is a a way to make us all poorer without truly helping raise the standard of living for all people in the world. Stay tuned as we uncover Bill C-47's potential impact on alternative health care and the well-beings of Canadians. That's all coming up right after the break. Welcome back. Are you curious about how Bill C-47 will impact the choices and well-being of Canadians? What are the implications of the controversial budget bill? Earlier this week, I spoke with nutritional consultant Chris Robinson of the Purple Carrot Health Store to find out how this bill could shape up the future of holistic practices and the availability of nutritional products in our country. Here is part of that conversation. Health Canada is saying that we need this to better safeguard public health, but there seems to be a lot of natural health stores across Canada who disagree. So what are some of your concerns? Well, the big thing is, is where natural health products are being put in the same category as drugs, and they're totally different. And so when you're trying to regulate two totally different things the same, it creates a lot of issues. And so in the big, there's a few, well, quite a few things that are concerning, but I think the biggest thing that's going to affect people, so people watching here, is cost. So there's a whole bunch of new fees that are coming in, and that's going to affect the companies um, and their ability to continue to create products. But then, so for those companies who don't close, who can afford to make all these changes, for those ones that do stay in business, there has to be some cost recovery for them. So it's cost recovery for the government, we pass on to cost recovery for the companies, which then moves on to us and then the consumers. And so costs are going to go up. We're going to have less product availability. Um, so the companies that are in Canada, again, there's going to be companies that can't afford to continue to produce products. There's going to be less products coming in, so less innovation, which we want. And then there's restrictions on what I can say as a nutritional consultant or working in a health food store. And we already have, boy, we have a lot of regulations in Canada. There's a lot of things I can say. I can say, for instance, you know, we cannot say this will cure that. That is that is illegal. We're not allowed to do this. We already have a lot of restrictions, and they're going to be putting in even more. How likely would you say that prices will go up for consumers, and how how by how much would they go up? Do you think? I can't imagine them not going up. I can't see a scenario in which they won't if this is allowed to continue to go through. Um, again, like we're looking at the amount of fees that are going in, they're crazy import fees, distribution fees, wholesale fees, site license fees, manufacturing fees, packaging fees, labeling fees. Like, and that's just for ones already in Canada, like for ones that want to come in, it's even more. And I read some like examples of what it can cost companies. And so for small businesses, small manufacturing companies, and there's a lot in Canada, it could cost them anywhere from like $60,000 to $200,000 annually. That's every year. And so that cost, that has to be, that has to be, you know, given to someone, like yeah, somebody has, has to be to that. by the consumer. Chris, do you believe that maybe some supplements might not be available in Canada any longer if this is the case? Yeah, no, I don't know how that'll look. Um, you know, and what companies, what brands, what will, what won't. Um, you know, we've had a lot of people really afraid that they're not going to be able to get their products and how quickly, I mean, it sounds like if this does go through, the actual rules sort of come into place in 2025, April of 2025. And from what I know is um, they're looking at, um, the Canadian Health Food Association um, did sort of a brand study and they were saying that 70% of brands figure they'll have to pull at least some product from the shelf. And it's due to, again, those, the, the claims we can make. So when uh, health products have been regulated since 2004. 
And so what they, they can make claims and we've been able to use traditional use as a claim. So there's so many herbs that have been used for hundreds and hundreds of years. So traditional Chinese medicine, traditional indigenous medicine, traditional herbal medicine. So you can use a claim like parsley has traditionally been used as a diuretic. But now what they're saying is you can't make that claim or you have to have double blind placebo studies or follow again the same parameters of pharmaceutical medications need to follow to have that product on the market. There's new labels that have to be made. So again, if you can't afford to, that product's gone. And so, yeah, how many products will be affected? I don't know. And we're seeing, unfortunately, that there's a lot of big, big, big corporations buying up little supplement companies, which will hopefully save them. But then again, we're getting a monopoly and we have yeah. big, big companies. And so we're getting less control in our industry. And it's just health food stores in the industry. It's, it's changing from what it should be. It's changing from what it used to be when I got into the industry, like, oh my gosh, decades ago. And yeah, it, it's sad because we will see, you know, again, 70% of brands having to pull their product. There's one in five brands considering moving out of Canada. And yeah, 83% of supplement companies feel like they're not sure if they can withstand the costs of this program. After the break, the four wheelers and the wide open vast spaces of Alberta's Crow's Nest Pass. That's next, keep it right here. Welcome back. With summer upon us, many people love heading into the backcountry of the Crow's Nest Pass. It's a great place for outdoor recreation, including quadding. One group that enjoys what nature has to offer, all while being a steward of the lands, is the CNP Quad Squad. Recently, we chatted with the club's president, who tells us the group helps to save taxpayers money as they take care of grooming many of the trails. Have a look. The Quad Squad is a non-profit organization that uh, was formed roughly 25 years ago, uh, incorporated 25 years ago. And our, our mission is really to promote safe and responsible riding in the Crow's Nest Pass on motorized vehicles. A uh, big component of that is education on, on how to ride responsibly and, and safely, and also to respect all the laws and uh, environmental impacts that we have on uh, on the environment. So uh, that, that's basically what we do. We, we do a lot of trail maintenance. We have purchased some uh, heavy duty equipment to be able to go into the trails and and smooth the trails out, take away of the erosion factors and to build uh, what's called swales, which are basically a hump in the trail to divert the water off the trail safely into the forest floor and, and not go into the creeks. So Gary, in recent years, I know quadding in the Rockies and in the wilderness has gotten some bad press and some people are against it, saying that it disrupts the migratory patterns of animals or that it's maybe bad for the environment or wrecks grasses, trees, bushes, what have you, right? And at one point, I think it was even banned temporarily. Uh, so what would your response be to all of that? Well, that's one of the biggest challenges that we had uh, Certainly at one point, I think we had close to about 2,500 kilometers of trails. And through the designated trail system, that has now been reduced to roughly about 600 kilometers. So there is a big uh, disruption in, in the trail system. Uh, most of the trails we have now have bridges over most of the waters. We're still striving to be 100%, but it's going to take a long time. Uh, so that was one of our biggest challenges to overcome. Unfortunately, when you reduce the amount of trails and more people are going on the, on the trails, so it's adding more traffic and, and possibly more damage. So uh, that was one of the reasons that uh, we made a decision to uh, to purchase some heavy duty equipment to go out and, and fix the trails. So we have a very aggressive uh, season to doing that. Uh, it's saving the money or saving the government uh, thousands of dollars a year because uh, we do it from our own fundraising and uh, stuff like that. So, uh, for example, last year, we estimated in kind, it saved the government about $66,000. So um, it's considerable and, and we love doing it. It's uh, We have a great crew to work with and everybody has fun. And again, I think that's part of the, you're talking about the fuel to, to join the club. That's part of it as well. 
We yeah. have over over 3,000 hours in volunteer hours uh, throughout the year. And everybody has a lot of fun not only working, but also going on the rides as well. Are there any special requirements someone might need to operate one of these vehicles? You don't need any special license or certificate or anything like that, right? No, you don't. It, it does have to be registered and insured, which is one of our, our club policies. Okay. You do have to wear helmets on, on a quad. Uh, provincially, the law says that if you're in a side-by-side -side with a seatbelt on, then you do not need a helmet. But on any of the quad squad rides, that is mandatory that you have to wear a helmet even in the side by side. So yeah. uh, safety first. Yeah. Uh, speaking of safety, I know every so often you hear about accidents or incidents involving an off-road vehicle. I know growing up, we had three wheel ATVs out at our cabin and almost every one of us kids had some sort of accident with it. Thankfully, nothing more than just broken bones. But I believe those three wheelers are now banned. But uh, do you ensure your members practice any other type of safety measures other than helmets? Like how does the group prioritize safety and responsibility for quad rides? Well, again, with the helmet use, uh, and you're right, three-wheelers have been banned, and there was a reason for it, and I rode them and know why they're banned, but uh, yeah, they, uh, mostly when we go in a group, then we have a meeting beforehand. Uh, we have to be very conscious that we're in, uh, in a wildlife corridor. Uh, the bears are out. Uh, we do carry bear bangers, and... Uh, we do have emergency satellite uh, equipment with us for any type of emergency. We also carry radios that we can communicate back and forth between ourselves. And then also, if required, we can also reach the search and rescue channels and, and the other government channels. So. Well, you haven't seen The Last of Us just yet. After the break, a Lethbridge landmark receives a permit for destruction and a local country singer is marshaled into service. That's next. Keep it right here. Welcome back. A permit has been issued to demolish the Lethbridge Hotel. The hotel was destroyed by fire on February 24th. City officials say the demolition should begin this week and will result in the closures of roads and sidewalks. Timeline for the works completion is not yet known. There is asbestos in the building, so crews can only proceed when we don't have strong winds in the city. Fire crews responded to the blaze at the hotel around 2.15 a.m. on the 24th of February. An investigation revealed that the fire was deliberately set and a 33-year-old Lethbridge man was charged back in May. Well, chances are you've most likely heard of the hit TV show, The Last of Us. The game turned television show captivated audiences earlier this year as a majority of the filming was completed in Southern Alberta. The Last of Us has been nominated for an incredible 24 Emmy nominations and some Southern Albertans could be taking home some of that hardware. Yeah, that's true. Uh, this year, the award ceremony is tentatively scheduled for September 18th and BCN's Micah Quinn has the story on the stunning locations and workers that helped make the show happen. It was very rewarding. It was very humbling to be nominated, of course. Penny Thompson is from Brooks, Alberta, and was a vital part of the hair department for The Last of Us. She even recently snagged an Emmy nomination for her work in the show. We had a fantastic team of four in the hair department. And then the head of department, Chris Bloomsdale, also brought in 35 other hairstylists from around Alberta, mostly Calgary and area. Over in Waterton Lakes National Park, parts of episode eight of The Last of Us were filmed at the Bayshore Inn. Staff with the hotel told us it was amazing to have Waterton become such an integral part of the show. It's huge, of course. And uh, and when they came in, they, you know, they took over the entire hotel. It was really exciting to see that opening shot of Waterton in the winter, because I love Waterton in the winter. Uh, it's an amazing getaway. Um, and to see the front of the Bay Shore and how they took all the signs out, of course, put their own their own spin on the front of the hotel, and they used other buildings in the park. It was just exciting to see 
our little slice of heaven on the big screen. The Last of Us even featured a CGI image of a destroyed high-level bridge in Lethbridge. According to the nonprofit group Keep Alberta Rolling, the economic impact of the show was huge for our province. A production like The Last of Us, you can imagine, yes, it, it employs thousands of people, but it also spends... Um, you know, tens, if not hundreds of millions of dollars on uh, goods and services to create that world. So lumber and antiques and, and furniture and costumes, um, painting, uh, any all these different items um, are purchased locally. And that's the, the great thing about the film industry is uh, it's a high spend industry and it gets dollars flowing in the economy. For Bridge City News, I'm Micah Quinn. Country singer, songwriter Corb Lund says he was surprised when he got the call from Lethbridge and District Exhibition to be this year's Whip Up Days Parade Marshal. He says he hasn't been in a parade since he was a kid in the 4-H Club. The multi-CCMA and Juno Award winner who performed on the Grand Ole Opry stage last year and starred in the movie Guitar Lessons has already had a busy summer. He just released a new album and has been touring all over the U.S. But Lund, who still lives in Southern Alberta, says says he'll be home just in time to lead the parade on August 22nd. This year's Whip Up Days theme is celebrating Southern Alberta, Canada's agriculture destination, which Lund says is a good fit for him. Oh, well, I mean, on one hand, I, it does, it's, it, seemed, it makes sense kind of, but I wasn't, I wasn't thinking of that. So I guess it was a surprise. Yeah. My family's had a long uh, association with the exhibition. Like, my uncle Tom Ivans was the president for years, and my drummer's grandpa was a president way before that, Ernie Snowden. And I think I competed it. I think I rode steers at the rodeo when I was a kid. My mom and dad competed there, so yeah, that's neat. It's neat, and it's it's kind of good because you know, as we all know, I I'm from Alberta and I live in Alberta, and my family's been involved in, in ag for 120 years here. My mom and my side is from Carson, and my dad's side's from Raymond, so they've been ranching and farming here for. An awfully long time. Some of the guys in my band too, actually. So yeah, it's it's feels like a feels like a good fit. Congratulations to Corb and hey, Whoop Up Days runs from August twenty second till the twenty sixth at Lethbridge and District Exhibition. Can't wait for that. After the break, is Southern Alberta becoming Hollywood of the North? We speak with a university professor to find out more about the film career opportunities in Southern Alberta. And if you are watching us on YouTube, please give us a like and also subscribe to our page. Keep it right here. We'll be right back. There, there's a lot of ups and downs, um, a lot of starts and stops um, in the industry. And I think that that's one of the, one of the benefits of having um, a post-secondary environment. 